Yes, start. Okay. Um, welcome everyone and a very good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lakanti Hun Sotun and I am the convener for today's webinar. I would like to begin with a quote, which we are all familiar with, which goes as, never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Amidst the present scenario, we have to adapt to the changes and hence platforms like webinars have provided us the opportunity to come together and learn. Gracing us on this occasion, we have our esteemed resource persons, Dr. Samantha Sain Clark and Dr. Amya Kumar Das, who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise on the topic, approaches to development, the trajectory in international development. Therefore, I'd like to begin this big uh, webinar and I would like to invite our respected Principal, Reverend Father Bivan Rodriguez Mukim, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Ms. Lakantil. Sautun. A very good morning to everyone. On behalf of Don Bosco College Tura, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to the national webinar on approaches to development, the trajectory in international development organized by the Department of Sociology, Don Bosco College Tura. Sociology Department, Don Bosco College Tura, is a young department which started three years ago. This year, the first batch of students will graduate from the department. And yet, being a young department, it has contributed so much to the college in terms of organizing regular department seminars, and also organizing soft skill training programs for the students. I would deeply appreciate the contributions of the department to the growth of the college as a whole and to the department in particular. This is to inform to you, dear participants, that under the Northeastern Hill University, the Department of Sociology Don Bosco College Tura is the first to conduct a webinar. As I welcome each and every one of you to the webinar, I would like to express my sincere words of gratitude to all those who made this webinar possible. I place on record my sincere thanks to the Department of Sociology, Don Bosco College Tura. I would in particular mention Ms. Lagintio Hun Sotun, the head of the department, Reverend Father Abhilash Vijay, the vice principal of Don Bosco College Tura, the faculty members of the department, Ms. Judalin Karshandi, Sir B.K. C.H. Sangma, Ms. Dona Christine Depp Burma, and other staff members of the college. I would like to thank the resource persons of the webinar, Dr. Amiya Kumar Das, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology, Tespur University, and to Dr. Samantha A.M. Clark, former lecturer, University of Sussex, UK, and the guest lecturer, Sociology Department, Northeastern Hill University. Thank you, dear resource persons, for sharing your expertise at this webinar. I would express my deepest appreciation to all the participants via Zoom and YouTube. A hearty welcome to the webinar on the team, Approaches to Development, the Trajectory in International Development. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to the technical team of the college, Sir John Satish and Sir Javelin A. Sangma, who made all the arrangement for this webinar. To all those who lend their technical support to the webinar, I would like to sincerely thank all of you. The college, during the time of the lockdown due to COVID-19, had conducted four webinars and a two-day international web conference. And this was made possible only with the collaboration of all the staff who dedicated themselves as well as the department to organize these webinars. The COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented disruption for the global health and development community. Organizations fighting infectious disease, supporting health workers, delivering social services and protecting livelihoods have moved to the very center of the world's attention. The COVID-19 pandemic demands rapid responses. We will be forced to learn quickly about what works 
some responses to the COVID-19 pandemic will be more effective than others. I'm hopeful we will learn which part of our bureaucracy respond most effectively so we can learn on them in the future. We can also learn how to better the use of data, evidence, and technology to improve our ability to react to crisis. In moving fast and learning fast, we strengthen the muscles. We as a community need to respond to a certain environments that are inevitable part of our work going forward. Even before the pandemic, the global health and development community has had to stretch its resources to meet global challenges and life-saving commodities have been underfunded. Now resources are likely to be more constrained than ever. Inefficient and wasteful spending will be even more noticeably during this crisis. The pandemic will force us to articulate what matters most and to prioritize investments. As we take part in this webinar, may it help us to understand this pandemic and how we can change or adapt ourselves to the new normal. Once again, dear participants, dear resource persons, and dear faculty members of Don Bosco College Tura, I welcome all of you to this national webinar on approaches to development, the trajectory in international development organized by the Department of Sociology, Don Bosco College Tura. Thank you, God bless you, and have a fruitful webinar. Thank you, respected Reverend Father Bivan Mukhin for your kind and, and wise words and for opening this webinar. Before we move on to the main part of the session, this is an important announcement to all the participants. If you have any questions for the resource persons or any queries, kindly drop your questions in the chat box below. We will take it up after the, the uh, resource persons have addressed, have presented the presentations. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Samantha M. Clark, who will brief us on today's webinar, which is on approaches to development, the tra trajectory in international development. Ma'am, before I would begin, I would like to give a short introduction about our resource person, Dr. Samantha M. Clark. Dr. Samantha M. Clark is a renowned person in the field of sociology. She had spent several years imparting the right skills and knowledge onto the students. She had served in reputed institutions like St. Edmund's School, Shillong, and Bosco Reach Out. She had completed her MPhil from Nehu and carried out her doctorate work in Sussex University, United Kingdom, which she also spent years, where she also spent years imparting knowledge onto the students. She has a bona fide record of uh, several research works carried out under her supervision and guidance. Therefore, now I would like now like to hand over the time to Dr. Samantha Sainpla. Ma'am. Thank you very much, Lakan Teo, and thank you for approaching me to give this webinar. Um, really appreciate this um, this space and this uh, opportunity uh, to uh, get to know all of you too. And um, and thank you to Father Vivan for organizing and the whole Don Bosco community in uh, Tura for organizing this particular uh, particular webinar. I kept on saying seminar. I'm not used to webinar at all. So. Um, so, uh, well, basically, when I first talked to Lakin Teo about this particular topic or this particular subject, and uh, I wasn't very sure about who would be the audience, and I thought, in accordingly, um, I would Dr. kind of... Samantha. Um, Dr. Samantha, yes. can we excuse a little bit? Um, your your uh, video is, I think it is not on. Oh, okay, okay, yes, okay, yes. okay. We would like to right. just put on your video. Well, one second, one second. Yes. 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 Can you no, see that? See yes. 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 Thank you. So, uh, so, so yes. Basically, when uh, when uh, Lakinti approached me, and I wasn't, I'm not sure um, how, the, the topic or who would be the audience. So, well, basically, what I'm going to do for today's uh, webinar is uh, taking into context the um, the title of the seminar, "Approaches to Development: Trajectories in International Development." I would first look at how do we understand the term development, all right? How do we use it? How do we conceive it? Or how do we interpret it over the years? 
out here. And then secondly, I would also look at the varied trajectories of development in the global perspective out here, and basically looking at it from a very chronological point of view out here. And, and, and uh, starting from the 1940s onwards to 2020. And um, so I'm going to make it very short because I don't have all the time out here, but if you have any questions relating to what I've said out here is, um, please please uh, ask me the questions and I probably would be able to, um, you know, to answer them um, after the webinar, after my presentation or maybe later. So uh, when we talk about development, development is such a vague, it's such in vogue nowadays. When you go anywhere, you talk about development. I mean, politicians talk about development a lot out here. And it has been in vogue for the last 70 years. And its actual meaning, actually, is still very elusive. OK, so different disciplines which um, explained development in very different uh, in different ways or the definition is different from one place or one uh, one discipline to another uh, discipline. And it also depends on where and by whom such a word has been used out here. Therefore, it is such a part of this ordinary buzzword, the hub hub, to be heard in countless meetings, wherever you go to any meetings at all. And it's devoted to issues ranging from agriculture to urban planning and international trade, or as much as to poverty reduction that we talk about in, in the international scene out here. And also, it might be include personal well being or industrial production out here. So you can see that it, it kind of covers a whole range of issues when we talk about development. So everyone may use it, be it, um, but whoever wants to use it would like to convey the idea that, quote and unquote, tomorrow things will be better. All right, that's a simple way of trying to understand development. Now. Strangely enough, however, the international career of the term development, um, coupled with the notion of underdevelopment, started with a very, um, as a public relation gimmick, literally thrown by a very professional speech writer to President Truman out here in 1949 in the inaugural address, um, and a fourth point for which it sounds a little bit original. So from the beginning, when the idea was first air in international scene, no one, not even the US president, really knew what development was about. This was supposed um, after Second World War out here. This is, was the first time when development was used in the international circle. So, however, uh, prefer the word from gaining. However, it doesn't, it doesn't actually um, um, become a barrier to, uh, to it um, being gaining a wide acceptance in, 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 in the international fear. Nevertheless, this international stroke of genius by the speech writer who used this word development in, uh, in, in, in uh, Harry Truman's um, speech, however, turned the two antagonists. Remember that in the 1940s, we've had, um, it is a time when most there's a new post uh, post colonial uh, new post colonial uh, countries had come out out there. Okay, so uh, this is a turnaround this relationship between the colonizers and the colonized out here into seemingly equal partners to a certain extent of the same family constant either more or less developed. So when we talk about development here, so we need to trace back that, that particular word. Where was it used? How do we understand that? At that particular point of time, it's been used basically to, I will talk more about this when we look at the, the trajectories of the different ways and how um, the, 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 the ideas of development came about later. So, so Theresa Heyer, for example, in 1960s, says that there's very little attempt to define development. Instead, there, is, there was an, an unquestioned assumption that development, whatever it was, could lead to improvement in the situation of the poor people. Okay, so no matter what, what, how we, we, we define it, um, it leads, according to Theresa Heyer, that however we are talking about the situation of the poor people, how do we improve the situation of the poor people? This, however, gives a clue as to why the word development started buzzing in dominant places, okay, and rests on an assumption, and no one cared to define it properly, especially during the 1960s. 
both elements characterize a buzzword, an, an, an absence of real definition, and a strong belief in what the notion is supposed to bring about. Uh, development therefore became a sort of a, a very um, uh, performative word. Saying by doing, it became a performative word. Okay, any measure from foreign investment, trade barriers, literacy campaign was from now on justified in the name of development, making the most contradictory policies look as if it's geared to improving the lives of the poor people out here. Now, this extensive use of the term development is to delineate policies, right, that were assumed to be necessarily good, also helped to build up a new schema for the perception of reality. This is very important when we talk about development. It, it kind of builds up that new schema for what kind of a reality is there? How do we perceive things? Okay, how do we perceive things out there? In other words, however, development was no longer considered a social construct or the result of political will, but rather a consequence of the natural world order that we deem just very desirable. Okay, so this is very... Uh, now, when you look at the work of Gilchrist, um, he deconstruct the word development a lot. He, he and Andrea Conwell were the first, I mean, uh, Conwell works, uh, was the, um, the director of um, ideas for a long time. And uh, uh, both of them had, uh, I mean, not, not him, but she and Ian Scones had um, written a number of work on, on participation and development. And basically, uh, one, of her, uh, one of her very good um, work, it says, about deconstructing development discourse the out there. And in one, in, if you get hold of this book, uh, Deconstructing Development Discourse, you will find that the varied way of how uh, development has been understood over the years. So Gilchrist says that why development has, has to a certain extent, um, sum up some of the ambiguities and persistent. It became a, vo a vague word. It became invoke, but also vague at the same time. But it became very much invoke in economic and political discourse out here. And it rests even more important foundation, namely that development corresponds to the generalized and firmly rooted modern belief. Without going through the theoretical debate out here, now because this most of you are sociology students, now let me just give you an analogy of how you, you relate the how how do you relate the understanding of development with what Imam Durkheim talked about in religion out here. Now, for example, it, Durkheim, according to Durkheim, no society can exist without religion. Since religion is an imminent social thing and religious representation express collective reality, religion here is seen as it relates to the belief of the given social group in certain indisputable truth. A belief that, you know, determines compulsory behavior in such a way as to strengthen social cohesion. Now we all understand, um, as sociology students, we all understand Imal Durkheim's work in religion out here. It is not about being a member of particular religion. It is about, you know, being part of that particular uh, social group and kind of religion ex ex uh, strengthen that social cohesion. Now in any society, various ideology are tolerated whether they are related to political parties or not. But in Durkheim's sense, religious beliefs are above ideologies. They are shared by all. As everyone believes that any person belonging to the social group also shares this belief. They are beyond dispute, all right? And entail various practices in the part of the belief who cannot evade them without endangering their cohesions out here or a group or risking, you know, um, being in the social outcast. Now, this account of the concept of religion should help us to explain why development itself can be considered as an indisputable truth that pervades a modern world out here. Whether, uh, whether the ideological um, creed, no politician would dare to run on an election platform that ignores economic growth and or development, which is supposed, for example, to reduce unemployment or create new jobs and well-being for others. Development has become a shibboleth, as I would say, an essential 
you know, an essential passion, an essential word, a password for everyone who wishes to improve their standard of living. So wherever you are, however you 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 tend to understand, um, um, try to define development out here, you need to look at it from that particular point of view. That it becomes a, a very essential thing and an essential thing to to, to look at and um, uh, an essential uh, password, for, for example, as everyone. And we understand that when we, you know, when we collect, elect our, our representative, our representative or our politician would definitely will say, right, you know, if nobody talks about development, therefore, you know, he's not a good politician at all and he's not thinking about the well-being of the people. So therefore, somebody would have to say something and would have to uh, probably mention development out there in his speeches. So this is, um, this is something that uh, I would like to bring into context to like us students and us people, uh, how do we understand development? How do, where are we and how, um, in the context in that we are, how do we understand development? How do we do development? What is the meaning of development to us? Okay, so something that uh, somebody would say, you know, a, a child psychologist, development would mean a different thing to them. For us, astrologers would mean different thing, and those who are in the development world would mean different thing altogether. But altogether, what I've tried to sum up out there is basically we're talking about the well-being of the people out here. We're talking about uh, something to improve the standard of living of, of, of the people out here. So coming back and, and, and going forward from, from that particular understanding of development, I will look now at the trajectories of the ideas of development in the global perspective. Um, Lakin Theo, can you please tell me when the time is up? Because I'm not sure how much time I, I, I do have out here. Sometimes I would go on. Okay, All please, right please time me. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so over the years, for example, ideas of development has evolved. So we've talked about development, the definition of development, um, but then also we need to look at how these ideas of development has evolved over the years. Now in 1969, Sears said, um, S-E-E-R-S, Sears, argued that the challenge confronting the developing world in post-war era has been fundamentally misconceived and that development consists of much less beside economic growth. All this time, right from the 1940s onwards, we find development ideas that has been um, basically, um, the economic growth has been in the forefront of understanding development. Uh, ideas at all. But then eventually we will see that basically economic growth is not the only thing that is important for, 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 uh, for de understanding development or we do not achieve development only through economic growth at all here. But however, the word well-being came into play, And of course, the word well-being has been promoted by Amartya Sen. Whoever has read uh, you know, development as freedom is one of his, um, the Bible of, of development uh, studies uh, 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 students, you know, people who need to understand development, international development should read Amartya Sen's work. And Amartya Sen is, um, had, had been uh, the one who um, basically promoted the idea of human development. He came up with, uh, you know, he focuses on the outcomes and opportunities that are intrinsically very important to the people itself out here, uh, rather than only as an instrument to achieve something or the means or the diversity of their the outcomes, sense concepts of capability stresses on the importance of understanding development as the process that enlarges one's choices. So we need to understand it is from this particular idea that we, under, we, we, we know about human development, the human development index came about in the United Nations. Uh, and therefore we, we need to understand also how then it is with his, um, with his hard work that that um, that eventually our focus only on economic growth or on only on the GDP started moving and started shifting towards understanding the well-being of the people, looking at, for example, literacy rate, looking, for example, of the education of the people, and therefore the approach became the 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 the, 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 the Till that time, there is a changing approach to understanding what actually development would consist of out here. So, um, so in the years following um, World War II, material wealth would not translate. You know, you could see that material wealth would not translate into better health care. It would not translate into education. It would not translate into better housing at all. The amount of money that post-colonial countries got 
just after their freedom, um, after their freedom, is a huge amount. I mean, like, um, you know, uh, we still have, uh, India still gets aid from, from the UK. Well, even though now there isn't, yeah, there's a, there's a debate that uh, aid from UK should be stopped because India's GDP is quite high. Um, but then again here, in short, however, when you look at that from that point of view, GDP itself did not capture individual individual well well being out here. Development thinking has significantly broadened its discourses after the Second World War, and increasingly include social and environmental factors of the development out here. And therefore, uh, it has, for example, let me just skip to because if I sorry about this. Um, then how do we look at the, the, the changing of, of development, uh, development thinking out here? They are, you look at um, the broadening of the approaches to development and development thinkers and the cooperation continues to be based on economic principle to a, a certain extent, but over time, there are broad strokes of development thinking that can be disappeared. Now, this is one of the things that there are quite a number of major implications out here, right from that time out here. Why development uh, thinking to a certain extent um, has changed over the time? First of all, it implied that it often implies that one size fits all approach. The understanding that the parts of others could be repl re replicated by 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 elsewhere in the in the, um, in the development strategies. However, when we look at South America, when you look at Asian countries, this particular one size fit all doesn't fit all at all. Okay, South South American countries to a certain extent, the dependency. Um, theory of dependency uh, way of understanding um, development um, came about around that time. And when you look at China, for example, the socialist um, economy that um, uh, that uh, carved the way for their for their development came around that time, and therefore it pushed development. The success of some of these countries in South America and in China itself pushed development practitioners to think very much differently out here. And secondly, for example. Uh, Mainstream development thinking has typically focused on individual sectors and divide between urban and rural. Now, development is much more complex and it implies a much smoother continuum. It crosses sectors, involve a wide area of, of actors and evolve in differently in different parts of the different territory altogether. And this is so important for us to understand, to understand that. Um, but however, during the past seven decades, I come to the trajectory now, during the past seven decades, development thinking has been much more than just a lively exchange of ideas about development and how it can be achieved. It has also been more of a preferred set of ideas out here at any given time, only to be replaced by a different set of ideas a couple of years later. Okay, so this is very important for us that, you know, the, the whole idea of development doesn't, it is, it's not the same since for the last 70 years. It's one set of idea which has been replaced by another set of idea and it came back again, a different set of ideas altogether out here. And then when you look at the seven decades of thinking, for example, we go to the uh, chronology from the 1940s to the 1950s, for example, they focus much on industrialization, growth and modernization. Bretton Wood of 1944 created the International Bank for Reconstruction, which we now call as the World Bank, okay, to help reconstruct Europe after the Second World War, all right? IMF um, came about around this time, all right, to deal with the trade issues, to support development policies, Lots of development thinking with the newly created United Nations organization out here. This is around the time when United Nations was created, different departments of it was created. FAO in 1945, UNESCO was created in 1946. Um, World Health Organization, which is in the picture right now, was created in 1948 out here. Therefore, development are viewed here as a process of economic activity in which country moves from tradition civilization through um, um, through a transition of industrial towards tertiary civilization in which serve uh, the service sector 
okay, down to industrialization and trade is the focus out here. So during this time from the 1940s to the 1950s, early to the 19, yeah, 40s to the 50s, you'll find that industrialization is the focus out here. And that's right. And there, you know, as, as a sociology, as a sociology students, we talk about modernization. We, um, we learn about theories of modernization theory out here. And this is where the theory, um, um, in fact, can be applied to understanding development for in that particular decade. And then we go to the 1960s where you have a structural transformation. In 1960s to the 1970s, for example, trade and comparative advantage is the central. Trade is the focus out here. Late 1960s, rise of dependency school in, in South America, Latin America, stress that international trade is is basically a disadvantage to the developing world out here. International trade seems to favor the rich countries and therefore developing world need to trade between themselves, periphery into periphery rather than center to periphery. Uh, and therefore it looks mostly very closely. This is the decade when they, they kind of look closely um, at poverty, okay? Uh, many, many projects came around around this time um, in, in, um, in, the, in this particular decade from the 1960s to the 1970s. Then you come to the 1980s to the 2000s. Now here you have um, Washington consensus came about around this time. Um, this is because of the oil crisis that was there uh, and therefore a radical more um, a radical way of looking into into development is is um, came about around begins around this time. This is a shifting back to the neoclassical policy. All right, uh, from the Washington from Washington base, uh, market liberalism came about under structural adjustment. SAPs SAPs of uh, impact a lot now. SAPs um, uh, structural adjustment policies. Um, have, it have impacted a, a number of countries out here. And there's quite a number of um, rural um, uh, poverty projects that are being initiated around this time out here. Role of information, ICTs expanded enormously in the 1990s. Tech, uh, techno, um, technology is viewed here as a driving force for growth. Okay, um, but also, Indigenous policy, extension and aid program became more and more, um, was given more and more attention to encourage and to support research and development. Now, this is a time, this is an era where you can, you can actually see a huge number of new ideas that have came about, coupled with, the, um, coupled with the, um, the introduction of ICTs, coupled with the use of technology in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the development world. And then, of course, here from the 2000 onwards, we have the goal, the goal based developments and the goal based development is basically the SDGs, MDGs and the SDGs. So in the early 2000, we have the MDGs, eight goals, 18 targets, 48 indicators. OK, and the SDGs and eventually. Uh, the, uh, the the more recent or oh, we are into the SDGs now, um, which was um, uh, came about in two thousand and fifteen. Um, one hundred and seventy, uh, uh, sorry, seventeen SDGs with one hundred and sixty nine targets out here. Now this is interesting because when I first had when we you know when I was still studying um, teaching in in Sussex, I used to ask my students basically to pinpoint. A particular SDG at that point of uh, sorry MDG, um, and to basically um, critique that MDG, look into the case studies of these uh, of, of a particular country. Where has these countries uh, are they did, uh, are they managed? Uh, do they manage to progress in some of these SDGs? What are the gaps between? A one particular country, a comparative studies between countries. If it works, one SDG is really, if some of the goals are being achieved in one country, then why is it not being able to achieve in the different countries? And sometimes my students would also come up with new SDG goals altogether or new targets that they think that is, 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 um, is missing from the SDGs. Uh, so this is very, very interesting as um, as a project for students actually, um, to be able to research more in the work or, or what is going on right now. And we have a lot of data out there in 
um, online that that actually shows the progress of some of the SDGs and the targets and the policies that have been uh, that has been a uh, thing and um, that is going on right now. So. So basically, mainstream development thinking has shifted many times, as we see now, right from the 1940s onwards to the 2000s, 2020s. It has changed over time, it has shifted many times based on accumulated global experience and influence from major events. We have major events that, uh, that has impacted our understanding and, uh, and how development ideas and projects has has you know, has come about, has projected over the years over here. So in the 2020s, now let's look around now, we're in the 2020s, 70 years of development theories, 70 years of development practices and discourse, scores and how to reduce poverty, achieve broader societal development and, and improve well-being. And the, the international development communities appears to have, for example, reclaim a broader consensus out here. When you look at the broader consensus out here, 17 SDGs have largely been accepted. Policies makers need flexibility when it comes to designing country strategies. Country strategies, for example, needs to look and choosing specifics arrangement regarding the role of the, um, regarding their role out there, basically looking at the local knowledge, looking at what kind of a local knowledge that is there that they can make use in 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 bringing about new ideas into development in 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 helping up with uh, uh, with new policies and programs out there. It's not just relying on the international policies and program, but amending those and and fitting those international policies and programs into what fits in into that local context or regional context and this is very important this is very important when we look at it now and of course when you look at many different projects now there is a there is a trend towards that i mean we can go on and talk about this but for example um robert chambers one of my my mentor in sussex has um written uh, particularly many books on participation out here participation participatory approaches and develop in development has been very famous and has been very very um, popular with um, in in many in many countries all over the world, especially in developing country. He himself was an academician. He was a civil servant in Rhodesia at one point of time, and his experience in Rhodesia, in looking at colonial colonial development projects, how it never really did fit in with the, 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 the type of work or the type of um, development that is needed for the people, made him look inwards and thinking, what are the gaps out there? And he came up with participatory approach out here. So we, we'll, we can talk about that later, which is um, the different approaches towards, uh, towards participation, but his idea was about that. It's trying to fit in into the problems that are there, um, um, trying to fit in the development policies into the, uh, to the localized uh, um, problems that are there in, in the country that you're working in. So in other words, there is no single best development part at all. Okay, uh, countries make use of lessons learned by other policymakers around the world. Multilateral organizations are helping to facilitate such an exchange. And today's world is being challenged like never before. And you know, the challenges are, uh, you know, there are different challenges. And right now we are facing one of the challenges that actually has been very predominant, the pandemic. Uh, that is uh, is one of the challenges that we, this, this is a very new uh, challenge that we are facing right now, even though we see it coming. Um, we we didn't really understand what the pandemic is until, until this year, okay? So what are the other types of new challenges that we now see in the 2020s? For example, new technological challenges, okay? The risk of cyber hacking, for example, new materials revolution. We talk about social challenges out here, the rapid population growth, in many of the developing countries, the increased mobility, risk of brain drain, increased mobility, migration that has been taking place. And you also have the most important aspect is the environmental challenges out here. Climate change, pollution, air quality, natural resource, na natural resource depletion, 
Okay, with the EIA coming into force, we now have to rethink about it, okay, about what are the, the new environmental challenges that we are going to face if EIA um, is um, the, the environmental impact assessment is going to be a policy, is going to be made a law out here and also the new economic challenges out here where the international economic environment is constrained by global rules remember wto is there there are quite a number of global rules that are there that restrains our our our, uh, our economic policies and programs out here and how do we look into these challenges you know in 2020 we are already facing one right now so i i i basically had to uh to uh um, wrap up in there and there are so many things that I've talked about here I've talked about development out here I've talked about the trajectories in different ways and looking at the challenges that are facing out here so if you have any questions later you can please go go ahead hello 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 good morning uh, thank you ma'am am I audible hello yes yes I can hear you I think I've got more time you should have just stopped me no, ma'am, it's all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samantha Simkla, for your enriching and insightful presentation on development. In spite of limited, limited time, you have managed to enlighten all of us uh, on the approaches of development from the 1940s to the present time. So I'm sure everyone here is leaving, carrying something with them on development. So uh, a few questions were raised. I think I would uh, like to take, would you like to take them? No, okay. I'll take it later. So after uh, after um, um, Professor Das has done his. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah. Thank you so much. I'll get back to you uh, in a minute. Now we have the next uh, uh, presenter and next resource person is Professor Amir Kumar Das. Sir, can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Next, we have uh, Dr. Amya Kumar Das, who is an associate professor of Dispur University. Oh. Can, you, can you hear me, sir? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Like some disturbance of this uh, flight, uh, the fighter jets flying over this guy. So. <laughs> All right. I'll just give a short introduction on uh, Dr. Amya Kumar Das. Dr. Amya Kumar Das is a renowned person in the field of sociology of development, sociology of governance, sociology of health and illness, sociology of religion, and so on and so forth. Dr. A.K. Das has completed his master's degree from Jamia Millia Islamia Del New Delhi. He had completed his MPhil from Delhi School of Economics and further on completed his PhD from Tezpur University in the Department of Sociology. He had shared his immense contribution to the field of sociology from teaching several emerging and important courses to having various publications. His contribution and dedication towards the field of sociology has greatly helped students in imbibing the right knowledge. And it is an absolute honor to have Dr. Das as a resource person for today's webinar. Therefore, sir, I would like to give you your time now. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I am particularly thankful to the Department of Sociology, uh, Don Bosco Palestura. And uh, uh, thank, uh, I also, I would like to thank uh, my co-presenters, uh, Dr. Sam Clark, because of uh, like her presentation, she covered almost everything in the, uh, like say, the trajectory of uh, development in the international arena. So then without, uh, because uh, she was so clear and like uh, elaborate in her uh, presentation, so I, I don't think that I have to repeat anything uh, related to that uh, concepts and uh, the trajectories of development in the uh, international uh, like uh, timeline or say in a different historical uh, period. So to uh, look at the whole idea of the practice of uh, development in terms of uh, like uh, disciplinary approaches, I would like to focus on two things like when we call that what I understand like uh, sociology of development and development sociology. When I say sociology of development, then looking at development from various kind of sociological perspectives, theories, and views, whereas development sociology, I would consider that as a like utilizing our sociological sense, sociological knowledge, sociological understanding, and using that understanding and knowledge 
uh, and utilizing that in the process of development. So as we understand uh, this whole idea of uh, development, uh, basically it has been used by different uh, uh, theorists, different uh, practitioners, politicians, bureaucrats across the time in different place according to their own convenience. As Dr. Clark already uh, has pointed out and focused on this issue that there is no clear meaning of development or def definition exists. It's very elusive and they vague in a way, but there are people, there are practitioners who understand this concept of development according to their own position, that socio-political or economic position. So if you go back to the whole idea of development, it existed from very ancient period of time. Like if we look at various kind of religious practices or the spiritual practices, the whole idea of development of the self or the inner group, it was there. But if you look at the whole idea of development from the notion of the Western practitioner or Western civilization, we have seen that the beginning of this enlightenment movement or enlightenment uh, philosophy along with the scientific revolution they focused on the idea of development one is the development of science and technology which will serve for the benefit of humanity and the other one is towards like that immanuel kant's famous essay on what is an enlightenment where he argued and advocated for a kind of coming out of the shell of immaturity and proceeding towards the light uh, from the darkness. So in a way, they were thinking of something of that a kind of development, uh, which will like uh, a, a person would denounce the whole idea of immaturity, rationality, and other form of men. Largely, we would agree that the in the post-independent, in the most of the post-colonial times and the after uh, Second World War, that we all agree that this whole notion of development, the politics of development, we may call it, it is controlled and directed by the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and all the powerful economic countries. So the con contestation of the idea of development, development as a concept, that, that is there. So uh, Dr. Clark has very clearly pointed out and uh, discussed the trajectory of development of how in different sectors and different time period of phases, the notion of development changed. There was a contestation and the new form of development came. So, I would like to focus about the anti-development approach. There, there was development that it was pointed out by various uh, theorists, practitioners, and the whole idea of development, what constitutes development, how development should be approached, that the criticism came from all the so-called uh, peripheries or uh, like, uh, global south, like say from Latin American space, like say you know, South Asia, Africa, so on and so forth. So when we come to the whole idea of development as a practice, concept, idea created by a certain kind of knowledge from a vantage point, then there is a kind of contestation in terms of uh, uh, questioning that who will decide what is the nature of development and for whom it should be uh, 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 like created. So there is a problem with this whole idea of universalism that this is the only way to be developed. Like if you look at the uh, W.W. Rostos, that famous formulation or maybe like infamous formulation about the five stages of economic growth and how a less developed or underdeveloped country should 
follow the path of development through certain phases and invariably they have to follow or they have to take up certain uh, initiatives so that they will be developed. But of late, we have seen how very powerful criticisms were offered against this the whole idea of development forwarded by W. W. Rostov and other a theorist of modernization theory. Like the certain theorists, the Western theorists, they tried to show and project this whole idea of modernization and westernization. See, there were very limited distinction, though these two things are different, but it was projected in certain ways that westernization is modernization. So post-colonial scholars and theorists, they started criticizing and attacking the whole idea of this modernization. People started projecting and discussing the notion of multiple modernities, vulnerable modernities. So thereby raising various costs. One of the most fundamental critic to modernity or modernism or the so-called mainstream development emerged from Indian soil. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, he projected the idea of Swaraj, that universal development, that why we should not follow any other civilization or a kind of modernism that come from the comes from the other part of the uh, say uh, regional place or nation. Thereby, we can see later on, like the the whole idea of small is beautiful, the concept of deep ecology propagated by Arnenes, and many more criticism in the form of alternative development, ethno development, local development, indigenous development that emerged out of this movement or in reaction to the mainstream developmental approach. So there are many movements across the world. If we read basically the two schools of thinking or two schools of thought propagated by the post-development theorists and the degrowth. So the post-development theorists say towards the 90s and 80s, they started questioning the whole idea of development itself. So they uh, collected uh, all the essays in the uh, one book called, very powerful book called The Development Dictionary edited by Wolfgang Sachs. You can have a look. So there are various post-development theorists like Majid Rahnama, Escobar, Wolfgang Sachs, Asis Nandi, and many of them, they were also influenced by Ivan Illich, that was a very strong critic of this whole, the so-called development, which is practiced in the uh, Western countries, main, mainstream, because the development, you may question that development is bad for some people, but at the same time, some people have argued by countering the post-development theorists, saying that in many parts of the world, the standard of living has increased, the education standard has increased, the life expect expectancy rate has increased. So what about that? That we have to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we are facing a deep, severe, and tremendous crisis in the front of environment. We have never before seen this kind of challenges. Also, we are facing unemployment, poverty, hunger, malnutrition. So the kind of the American dream and goal that we see and imagine, it is not always like that. There are deceptions. That is the image has been created that developmentalism, that a kind of ism, that idea that
expect us to look at things beyond the appearance. We have to investigate deep within and try to understand how it is practiced, what is its aim, what is its motive, and then in a real sense, we need to understand the process of development. The other school, the degrowth, they came off, though the idea of degrowth was there, but this basically came in a conference and it, it became uh, popular from 2005-2008. So degrowth people, they argue, like Sarge Latus is the, like one of the like, like propagators and advocates of this idea of degrowth. They argue that growth has brought devastation. We don't need growth. They argue against the materialistic life, culture, the overconsumption. So thereby they promote and advocate for more dignified life. Conviviality. They argue for the uh, harmonious living and the respect for nature, environment, ecology, and thereby we can develop our inner self in a more mature manner, in a more evolving manner, rather than running after a kind of artificial competition or uh, looking at this infrastructure as the marker of development, like road, multi-story buildings, skyscrapers, bridges, and the energy station. And a simple thing that simple energy can bring crisis to our society that more than 90% of our life is dependent on energy. Even when we sleep, we depend on energy, that we need a uh, fan or new, we need air conditions. Most of us, those who are used to this kind of urban life or the life which is uh, facilitated by uh, energy-driven technology that we are dependent on. So, this kind of consumption-oriented life is, uh, uh, is a question by this degrowth people and they advocate more of this kind of overall well-being on development. So by locating this local development or the participatory development that people would decide that what is good or bad for them and then can we formulate a whole idea of, uh, or the process of development that is uh, beneficial, the kind of example we can take from our neighbor country, Bhutan. As the whole world is looking and measuring the growth in terms of GDP, our neighboring country in 70s, their king developed the concept called this gross national happiness. So this happiness should be the measure of development or growth rather than and uh, various kind of ecological and uh, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity. So having respect for all forms of life and diversity in reality would bring the real kind of happiness that is suggested. Coming back to the whole idea of development that we have seen, development was a buzzword word in the second post second world war era and the post world war era, but of late, the whole idea of governance has taken a prominent shape. If not, it has replaced the concept of development, but up to a kind of significant and substantial way, it has uh, uh, placed itself in the international discourse, the idea of good governance. Why good governance is needed? The World Bank report suggests that to have efficient governance, one has to minimize corruption. And how you can bring good governance that you have to make more privatization. So the neoliberal approach, making everything private that through the liberalization, privatization and globalization approach in the market approach, the marketization of social life is a big challenge in today's time. In contemporary times, as a society, as individuals, we are 
confronting in every day, in every aspect, the marketization of the social life. That how a life that if we look at Karl Polanyi's work is the great transformation in the landmark work, we will come to know that how things became monetized and marketized and where thereby we lose the social essence that Marx has also has taught. Like that when we lose the social essence or the life of thing and the things become spirit that the um, criticism that we fetish, then that, that become a problem. So by coming back to the local example that how I'm not eulogizing or like uh, uh, that uh, say kind of uh, romanticizing the whole idea of the participatory development or this whole idea of relativism, but the extreme relativism like as propagated by the de post-development theory is also a problem and like universalism is also a problem. So by looking at how well we can strike a balance between these two and try to understand development in our own terms. If you look at the present crisis of COVID-19, even that it has exposed even very powerful country, the, those, who the, those who claim themselves to be the superpower in the world, like the United States of America, they are suffering. We have seen it has exposed. Whereas a small country like Cuba, where they practice a kind of public welfare system, the public health system, their doctors and health workers, they travel all the way to Italy and help them during the crisis. Even the powerful countries, European countries couldn't help Italy, whereas Cuba, the crew members, they came, the health practitioner and the help that all we have seen to various kinds of new channels. Similarly, India is a huge country. It's almost like a like combination of three continents in terms of its population size. If you put together you know, uh, North America, Latin America, and Europe, its population is almost the same. It's like only 20 crores less than that. But the, if we consider all the states as small, small countries, like the many of our states are bigger than European countries, that these few states, those who are doing good in terms of dealing with the COVID-19 cases, the states like those who are practicing more decentralization. Like they listen to the local system, feedback system, like in the Kerala, 40% of their non plan fund that goes to the uh, Panchati Raj institutions for, as a form of flexi fund and maintenance fund. And they have the power, decision making power to utilize the fund and how best they can use that for the public welfare or the, for public goods. So that is why we have seen how good is the public health system and public education system in Kerala and of late Karnataka also the uh, Panchati Raj uh, 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 like PRI members and the, uh, like other uh, elected members they uh, they uh, promised and then they work that they they know not a single person should go hungry or sleep without food so they started working through various kind of grassroots level organization. So development is a kind of uh, imagination or bubble or a real term in terms of practice that we need to question it and understand it in the local context. It cannot be like a, a thing coming from the above, like the laissez-faire model, which was propagated by the market advocates of the market. And we've seen how uh, people suffered and it didn't work as per its thing. So, the whole idea of a development, the whole idea of the practice, the governance, that how uh, as a student of uh, sociology, we needed to integrate all these ideas and try to understand both in terms of the international discourse and the local and regional discourse. And as a student of sociology, what I think and feel that the practice of that like Budu and others, the practice of reflexive sociology, like Anthony Giddens or the Ulrich Beck's idea of the risk society, how the more we become modern, the more risk we generate in terms of like the ecological crisis, like that various kind of nuclear, like explosion or crisis that happened in Chernobyl or in Japan, other parts of the world that we invite more trouble for us. So what is, uh, needed here is a kind of reflexive sociology, reflexive modernization, 
and in every step of our life, in everyday life, we should interrogate and keep on asking question that whether it is good for the society, it is good for the individual, and more importantly, is it beneficial and good for this earth? So with this, I conclude, and I'll be happy to interact and uh, like clarify uh, questions and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ilke Das, for a very clear and informative presentation on development. In continuance with uh, Dr. Samantha's presentation, you have managed to join the dots and give us an enriching presentation. Therefore, now the floor is open for questions. I will first uh, address the questions to Dr. Samantha's in Clark. Uh, Ma'am, are you there? Uh, Samantha? Sorry, I just got disconnected there. Okay. Um, I think it's it's the internet um, here in the university. Um, sorry, would you repeat that again? Um, yes, we'd like to, uh, some questions were raised uh, with regard to your uh, presentation. So I would like to take a few. Um, am I audible? Can you hear yes, me? Yes. Okay, uh, first question is from Siron Max. He says, seeing and doing in the perspective of development, is this a reality in today's scenario where in India, rich become richer and poor become poorer and basic necessities of human lives are neglected? Um, well, to that, I would say seeing and doing is not really, it is romanticized as just like Dr. Uh, da said earlier, that sometimes we need to critique uh, development. Everything is not rosy and not everything is not utopian in the way in how we would want it to be. Um, and we know that there's a gap between the rich and the poor, definitely we've seen it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's how, and this is where, uh, and this is where we need to, to uh, as students, as researchers, we need to look in depth into why this is going on. What are the, the you know, the gaps that are there between the, what are the reasons behind the gaps between, is there a, is there a failure of these policies and programs that has been in place to raise or to, to reduce poverty? In these, in uh, in the in the um, in the different countries, or regional level, or at the at the village level, all right. And there's a very good work that probably um, you would like to look at. It's called the anti politics. I mean, as Dr. Das was talking, it reminds me of a work by Ferguson who wrote about the anti politics machine uh, in the Zotho. It's a very interesting work where he looks basically not at the um, you know, at all the rosy things that development brought about in Lesotho, but also why policies fails, why um, uh, why the certain approaches that um, there's so much money going on in aid uh, in, in African countries, but why has it failed? Why hasn't it reached a certain level? So yes, um, seeing and doing as you can you can look at it from that point of view. But um, as I said to you earlier, it's, it's not um, ideas changes, perspective changes, practices changes, all right? And because of that, you accumulate these changes and you see where, where has it gone wrong? And if, if there's certain things that has gone wrong, then is there a way to better that particular, uh, particular perspective or that particular approach or that particular practices, okay? So that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the second question is, taking India's population in consideration, which has over 1.3 billion, what strategies could be applied to bring development to the country? <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me here, Dr. Das? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, thank you. You are so clear in your uh, like uh, approach and presentation. I must uh, thank you. See, uh, means, uh, that, I, uh, that I, I, I have been uh, like say, uh, putting this like, uh, we do not have to consider ourselves as a country. Like the problem yes. will begin when we look at ourselves as a, from the centralized uh, form of governance. We need to exactly. consider that in a real sense that federalism, that only mm -hmm. except few like say, I 
this network. I think we've lost contact with you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I apologize in for terms that. of say, uh, sorry. Yeah. Can can you hear me? We yes, sir. We can yeah. hear you now. Okay. Yeah. So so that we we think that it is like say, uh, uh, four crores or like say state of Meghalaya, Assam. So that it will become easier for us to plan and execute programs rather than competing with each other and questioning each other, creating fiction and like a kind of bad feelings rather we all can work in in a synchronized manner and focus on our own state like especially say look at and empowering various kind of uh, local grassroots level organization and the feedback mechanism thereby it will be very uh, strong and that in a way we can connect with each other so thereby by we, we, we can also work and it doesn't, uh, need, you don't need a rocket science for that. It is as simple as that. Like people have proved that, that if they work in the grassroots level, you just strengthen your grassroots level organization and only you work towards two things. It's very simple. Like one is health, which is like the right to life. And another one is education. Our government infrastructure is already there just to like say, uh, uh, refurbish some kind of schools, then uh, install more toilets where the students, especially the girl students, will not uh, drop out of, from the school. And then just when then the kind of quality kind of thing where teachers will be and facilitate them. Instead of punishing people, just facilitate them, train them in a certain manner that they'll be able to teach and create an environment so that you will be definitely able to work towards the huge population if you just divide the responsibility and divide the governance mechanism. I don't think that is impossible. And we have seen how in many Latin American countries and even in South Asian mm -hmm. context, countries, those who have invested in health and education, they are this social development index or human development index is much higher. And uh, it, sometimes we feel uh, ashamed of this, but our human development index and social development index is not uh, like we are not doing better than many African countries or even Bangladesh. So I yeah. think uh, we, we, we have to yeah. prepare for that. Thank you, sir. Um, since I, I'll just put forth the questions and either one of you can answer. All right, the next question is from Sir Briefwell Mouthor. He says, um, we understand that economic growth is an increase in GDP and economic development is an increase in GDP and well-being of the people. So is economic growth a necessity condition for economic development? Shall I repeat? Yeah, he yeah, says? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I followed it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. May, may, I, may I respond? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So generally in technical sense, we differentiate between economic growth and economic development. Economic growth is generally uh, like measured in terms of GDP. Yeah. Whereas economic development, we also look at various other indicators of life expectancy, mm -hmm. health, education, and other things. So it is not necessary, it is useful and essence important to have your economic growth for economic development, but it is not solely dependent on your growth. It is dependent on how you plan and how your political will of the government or of the country, it depends on that. It is not only like if you look at this, uh, the per capita income of various Indian states are more than, say, Kerala and other places. But in Kerala, your uh, human development index and social indicators are better than many other rich states like your Haryana, Punjab and other places. Here you need a kind of will to uh, have, a, if, have an effective governance in terms of or addressing various kind of social and development indicators. So money is necessary, but it is not the only condition. The most important thing for uh, the uh, economic development or uh, overall development, overall being is your plan, education, and political will. Uh, same person, a follow-up question with the uh, previous question that I just asked. He says, also, can we achieve economic development without economic growth? Can we achieve economic development without economic growth? Uh, see, with economic growth or without economic growth, it is a, like a difficult question. 
see to survive we have to earn we have to work so but mm. if we over emphasize on the growth aspect then it will lead to crisis that the now presently we are seeing in a capitalist world but all of us we work and it is not a kind of consumption or materialistic development it's a kind of overall well-being development and there is a no kind of beyond a point money works as a kind of you may have billion dollar but that is in statistics even rich billionaire they cannot count the number of zeros put before the like they are well so it it's all about statistics by the end of the day only you eat rice and roti you cannot eat gold you cannot eat diamond so in that way we have to Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, next question from Frederick Sangma, and he quotes: He says, "Since you mentioned, ma'am, since you mentioned, no society can exist without religion." So his question is: Can there be society without religion? And uh, what kind of society it will be without religion? Uh, okay, so this is um, uh, is a little bit out of context out there when we're talking about religion out here. I'm not going. I'm not talking about religion out here. I'm drawing an analogy of trying to understand what Imad Durkheim is trying to say about religion out here. Religion to Imad Durkheim is not about a particular denomination or about you being a Hindu or a Christian or anything, but it's also about a bond that is there among the society, the members of the society. All right. So what I'm trying to look at here is just. like how development is now being seen in, in, in a way in how uh, you know you, you it, it goes beyond ideology the way in how we understand development sometimes is beyond ideology so i'm just trying to grow uh, to bring an analogy there so i'm not um, i'm not actually looking at whether society can exist in religion or that's completely a different angle altogether okay there are societies that <laughs> that they don't have religion or established religion at all so again here you have to go in depth again what is religion out here so it's just it's just an analogy that i'm bringing out here um that development is seen as a religious thing okay uh in in a way in how we use development to a certain things to get to make our life better okay all right so. thank you ma'am <laughs> for the clarification next question yeah. since we have yeah. quite a number of questions i'll go quick uh, from bishar lang pinrope he says what are the various indicators of development plenty <laughs> um <laughs> health wealth economic growth um life expectancy education um um and now women's empowerment okay uh, or when you say um the gender gender equity so you have very different so as uh, coming back to economic growth and economic development all these indicators are into in in economic development are part of economic development and uh, and 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 it has an impact on the growth of course but um but there are so many indicators all right e- everything in our life is governed by some of these indicators okay so um whether we look at, at, at our higher education is also one of the indicator probably and it's also maybe for example mortality rates of the kids of of children is also part of the indicator malnourishment is also one of the indicator now meghalaya has been classified as one state that has got the most malnourished people okay so we are very malnourished here in meghalaya even though we have lots of 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 rice and dal <laughs> So what I'm saying is that so these are the things these are there are so many indicators now the point is that which um, and we cannot say that one indicator is 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 more important than the other because all these indicators have an impact on 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 the overall development of of the state or overall development of the community okay for for example we tend to focus much on 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 education we tend to focus much on the health because these two are for example quite high on top in some of our especially in developing countries or we are in uh, uh, or in uh, you know in some of the brick countries it's quite pretty high on top okay i hope i answered the question yeah yes thank you ma'am um next question from moirang tham santosh He says, "Sir, will it be possible to fight against the ongoing pandemic and economic program programs going together?" Shall I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, yeah. So, yeah, I have seen. Uh, see, the initial uh, like all over the world, the kind of uh, like uh, the response to the pandemic uh, was different. 
like in indian context as we have seen like it was uh, like more uh, stringent in terms of the lockdown and other sort of uh, policies but now the uh, we have realized that including the government that this kind of thing will not work because it created a kind of crisis like in terms of <laughs> livelihood that like many people like it is estimated that uh, like the alternative economists they have estimated that in india though the official figure says it is 21% around the people who stay below poverty line but it is almost like 70% like the most of the people they are either dependent on uh, farming or agriculture agricultural activities or this uh, uh, labor that like manual labor like the casual labor wage labor so when there was a like lockdown strict lockdown we have seen how it uh, like uh, created a kind of chaos crisis like unprecedented crisis and now the government realized and they are going for one after another the uh, like unlocking of this uh, like uh, lockdown so there are crisis of two thing one is life another one is livelihood so how to strike a balance between the life livelihood and the economic growth so we have to be careful in terms of like uh, that people those who come back to the rural areas like the migrant workers and there are difficulties that we cannot employ all the migrant workers in the uh, say mg narega work mm-hmm. like by digging pond or making road because many of them were maybe involved in different activities like like the hotel sector service sector technical sector and they would not like to take up this job at the same time you may like create a kind of different kind of avenues but that 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 creates a kind of well good uh, intensive planning and execution though we may not expect that normalization like in a pre pandemic era that we used to have the kind of economic growth or uh, uh, like that kind of economic activities now it is very restricted but yes it is not impossible by phase by phase like focusing on agriculture focusing on rural based activities maintaining physical distance and of course the migrant workers uh, may go back return to the cities when the situation is being normal otherwise they will again suffer and uh, like say, the, the distress kind of situation uh, will be there so better to plan it in a phase manner but i am again uh, like emphasizing on the one thing it cannot be like in a regular or normal situation but of course if we can plan it in a phase wise manner uh, or in a kind of uh, well planned manner both we can create or initiate this economic uh, activities or economic growth. Uh, thank you, sir. And, uh, next question is from Ms. Yar- Laya Rihun Longland. She says, how will the current pandemic crisis change the trajectory of development discourse in the years to come? Shall I repeat? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, if you want to, yeah, go ahead, yeah, and then I can add yeah, one. Yeah. Or, 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 uh, Well, you, you, you go ahead and then I can... Yes, all right. Um, a very interesting question about this because I had just recently read something about how the SDGs goals now, um, you know, there has been a lot of focus, there's a lot of money going into um, programs and projects to achieve the SDG goals, which is part of the global um, goal-oriented um, um, uh, part of, of, of development, approach to development. But then how these particular... money now has been to been divert, diverted to a certain extent to um to to uh, to counter this pandemic uh, uh, putting more money into health for example putting money into more into uh, uh, diverting money from what is supposed to be given for a particular goal is now being taken away from there and being put away for for example for the livelihoods of the people okay for example let me tell give you an example Uh, a huge amount of money uh, that was delineated by uh, by the british government uh, to give to the, the most of the asian countries um, as aid has now been taken away defit has been um, done away with because we don't have an international development department in in uk anymore and that has been kind of um, um, integrated with uh, the home affairs department simply because much of the money that is going to be given in aid has now been diverted to basically looking into the welfare of the people of those who've lost their jobs in uk during the pandemic 
Okay, so, um, and so each person applies for it. For example, if I have a clients or if I have employers, uh, employees, four or five employees, because I don't have money anymore to pay, pay those employees, I get that from the government. About two million pounds has been given by the government to to uh, to this. So what I'm trying to say out here is, is there will be probably a, a different way of under, uh, of looking. There will be a, probably a, a different diverted way of look uh, of trajectory after the 2020 that we are not seeing it right now we're looking at the, the 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 progress that is going on right now we're looking at we're trying to examine uh, what is happening in cuba what's happening in america what's happening in 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 mexico for example and what is happening really here in india okay uh, so so yes i think there will be um, a, a different way of looking at it but uh, uh, right now, most of the SDG goals, we will look at it, we will see the result in another year's time. If we look at the graph and we look at the, many of the research reports, we will see that how pandemic has in fact really impacted on, on, on the achievement of some of these goals later. Okay. okay. So, so would you like to add anything? Yes, like uh, I uh, like um, uh, the way we have uh, seen this pandemic like uh, in terms of like sustainable development goals and other things like uh, yes. we work with the UNICEF and like uh, and other uh, uh, agencies like they have really like they have changed their approach or there is a kind of paradigm shift yes. in policy and other things but yes. in term in terms of the market as you know like uh, the uh, as Marx himself has uh, said and other like capitalism has its own uh, like uh, once it uh, uh, starts like uh, it has its own spark. So we, we are not sure about the market logic or market approach, but we are sure like how the social welfare mechanism will be uh, like approached or looked at, it will differ, but I'm not so sure about the behavior of the market or behavior of the economy. Yeah. Like, you know, during this pandemic yeah. also, there are big projects are going on big like kind of bargaining and the negotiations are yes. going on in terms of environmental yes. project, in terms of yes. uh, various kind of developmental yes. projects. Yes. So uh, there is all, like say, yeah. if you look at the Spanish flu, it happened hundreds of years before, like but apart from few, uh, many countries like uh, especially the like countries like us, we, ha we, ha we have not been able to develop the public health system. And now also we are relying more on the market system of the healthcare provisions and all. So there is there there there, uh, there will like we'll need to uh, uh, like wait and watch that how these uh, policymakers and the private sectors and the social welfare sectors, education sector, health sector, they will approach and how the market because this day market is also a big player which is influencing our everyday life, the influencing the society, influencing the state. So that we need to watch. Okay. Uh, since we've passed our time, I'll, take, I'll be taking up only three more questions. Uh, the next question is from Fabian Bakladi. So she, it says, we have been talking about development in various aspects of the society. Can we really say that development has taken its roots and why there are still poor people, hunger, discrimination in the society? A follow-up question. How can we eliminate poverty in the society, particularly in India? How can we eliminate poverty? We're still ongoing. We're a young nation. We're a very young nation. We're still ongoing. Poverty, there are so many policies and so many programs that has been initiated by the government. Um, a huge amount of money is coming from both multilateral agencies. Um, and, and, and there's a huge effort uh, to actually reduce that. But if, if, if you look at really, if you look at the statistics or the data that is available, we have achieved to a certain extent, to be honest with you. Um, it's not all gone already and it's not all gone wrong at all. But of course, with the population growth, I can say um, it's still a very challenging, um, um, challenging way of, uh, there are many challenges that are, that are there in us to achieve really no poverty. I mean, even in, um, even in the developed world, we still have people who are, um, who are uh, street dwellers, okay? And we look at America, there's so many people who are homeless. You look at London, you go and walk the street of London, you'd be have people staying in the streets. 
So even developed countries are still facing poverty. But the way in how we understand poverty here is so different. I, I would ask you to look into the, uh, the, um, the work of... Um, forgotten. It says the voices of the poor. It's a World Bank organization um, uh, um, ethnography about what to really understand, how do people really understand what poverty means? Poverty for me might mean something else. Poverty in the UK would probably not getting social assistance or not getting Sky TV. But for me, poverty might be, for example, not getting a morsel of food. Or poverty in South Africa would probably mean um, not being able to uh, to fight off the, the the gang wars. I mean, you know, so poverty might mean different things in for different people for in different contexts altogether. So we need to look in depth into that, and it is a challenging thing. It is it is a it is an ongoing challenge uh, challenge that that every country every country faces. Okay, not only in India. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, the whole idea of poverty depends on the who is looking at what. Like the Majid Rehnama says, the it lies on the eyes of beholder, like how you look at it. And like in the Swana community in Africa, where they, they say that where there is no wealth, there is no poverty or no poor people. Exactly. It depends on the wealth. And when when the locust attack, like the uh, like like say one month before or two months before locust, there was a locust attack. So in Africa yeah. they say when mm -hmm. locust attack. The rich people, those who are having cows, they are like scared and they are worried. But the poor people, those who do not have cows, they are happy because they will eat the locust itself. So there are yes. like different approach and understanding about the poverty. And there are like, as we know, like relative poverty and uh, this absolute poverty. So even rich people might feel that they are poor in comparison to somebody else. But at yeah. the poverty is the basic necessities and provisioning without the, uh, like the absence of a basic uh, social welfare mechanism like the food, like the health service, education, and the policy. We've lost him again. Yeah, there he goes, right. you can hear. In a way we can approach the whole notion of poverty, I want to reduce and uh, eradicate poverty, but it is not successful because it is not as simple as that. It's very complex. And uh, if you ask me, how can we eradicate poverty? I would say without attacking poverty, we should focus on health and education and automatically it will lead yes. to develop. Like the Karan Singh said, like how can we uh, like control our population? He said like development. So development is the best contraception best contraceptive that we do not have to go for any kind of policy you develop people you empower them automatically you will achieve like overall development not the sectoral development so okay. all right thank you sir thank you ma'am um second last question uh from edilbert osman he says the effectiveness of community organizations is the core of tribal communities in the process of development but with the current pandemic again how can they deliver their services effectively this question was directed to sir. Uh, uh, the yeah, effectiveness yeah. of community organizations is the core of tribal communities in the process of development. But with the current pandemic, how can they deliver their services effectively? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it should not be a problem. As we have seen, initial two months that state mechanisms or the governments, or the official from the governments, they started or they were working towards the like containment of this uh, pandemic or this uh, problem. But towards the second half, since say uh, June, July, and in the month of August, we have seen now the community members themselves, they started taking care of the problem. Like people, those who migrated from the rural area, uh, sorry, uh, city areas or the urban scape to the rural areas, we have seen in parts of Meghalaya and Manipur and other places, Due to this community organization and their initiative, they have converted some school as quarantine center. The people, the mm -hmm. PRIs like Panchayat, they started supplying food to them. And, you know, presently many of the quarantine centers, they have removed it. Government itself, they have removed it and they have converted it to the hospital. Positive cases only, the patient will stay. And there is no concept of quarantine. That means those who have to quarantine themselves, there is no 
official provision rather they have to either home quarantine or facility created by the community level services or community organizations so keeping this uh, safety measures in mind or the covid protocol there always it is possible and it is, people are doing it community people are doing it and uh, i think it is uh, possible uh, this community services during this part of pandemic itself all right sir. thank you and the last question from nadeem kharsantio with regards to the northeast region do you think we will ever become a fully developed region since we are still lagging behind in terms of so many aspects you can put answer since it's the last question <laughs> go ahead first sir <laughs> oh, okay. so see uh, again as uh, madam suggested and we have been uh, like uh, say uh, discussing uh, this issue of the development that uh, what we understand by development as you know mm -hmm. northeastern region is located in a very uh, geopolitically sensitive uh, like uh, its location is very sensitive when we call it northeast like people in mainland india and elsewhere they think that it is outside maybe india or like uh, some many people to be frank many people do not understand like actually the what is the reality but when we see uh, like in staying inside the northeast india and calling ourselves as northeast india is a kind of it may create a kind of contradictory or i don't know man how to put it but it's a kind of geographical location but not in terms of ideas practices culture yeah. Our people yeah. are all having different uh, uh, means indigenous knowledge system. Our traditions are different. Our values, core values, approach, the community uh, feeling, the and uh, like uh, treating our guests and uh, people from other community. It is uh, very like uh, there is one thing it. So by developing ourselves in uh, like uh, keeping uh, the image of any say mumbai delhi hyderabad bangalore will not help us if we develop like our region is very seismic region like it is prone to earthquake and if you look at like the imphal or uh, silong and uh, silong is considered to be like i think largest uh, hill uh, city of india means in in practical sense and if you look at that aizol and other places that a big multi storied building are there so how to manage that means what should we call and if, if now slowly that these are the landscapes are disappearing in meghalaya if you go to look at the aesthetic uh, sense of small wooden house with uh, window glasses like you feel like certain parts of europe you are there but slowly the modern so called the infrastructural projects the multi skyscrapers building i think slowly they are uh, capturing the landscapes so the whole notion of development for us that we need to that i said like as a student of sociology we need to contemplate we need to think we need to reflect on the uh, the true sense of development for uh, us development is to large scale building or the dam or the nrg uh, producing uh, power houses or for us good health good education the capability to think the capability to connect ourselves with the nature the capability for ourselves to connect with the ecology as assam meghalaya and other places they are known as the biodiversity hotspot like in the world so to preserve that and to live a like harmonious life with the nature and ecology that is important for us or to destroy that and build four ways lane road and big big bridges that is the motto so in that case if you are thinking or analyzing that you need to ask yourself that i am not a person that i can say that the northeast will be able to develop or not develop but we have to see what are the parameters we are looking for what kind of development we are imagining and what kind of policy we are formulating to place ourselves within that bigger frame Oh, I, I I agree to all what you say. So I think you've answered the question there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. All right. Then with that, we've run out with all the questions. I like to thank both our professors, Dr. Amya Kumar and Dr. Samantha Simpla. I think you've tackled each and every question very clearly, and I'm sure the participants must be satisfied. So coming over to the last part of the session, I'd like. to hand over the time to sir biki c s sangma assistant professor department of sociology who will deliver the vote of thanks over to biki biki are you there am i audible yes 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 okay honorable speakers respected principal 
and dear participants, I, Vicky Sangma, on behalf of Don Bosco College, Thura, and the Department of Sociology, and the entire organizing team, I take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar successful. First of all, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Amir Kumar Das, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology, Tejpur University, and Dr. Samantha Shem Clark, former lecturer, University of Sussex, UK, guest lecturer, Sociology Department, Nehu. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. I would also like to thank our principal, Father Vivan Rodriguez Mukim, and our head of department for our untiring effort to make this webinar successful. A special thanks to the organizing committee, teaching and non-teaching staff for their support and coordination. Finally, thanks to all the students and participants. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Once again, I thank all of you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, you. Um, you. you sir, Vicky, for delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, this is an important announcement now to all the participants. Uh, the feedback link will be sent uh, right after the session of which you are to fill it and submit it immediately. The link will be available only up to 1.30 p.m. So kindly fill it up uh, as soon as possible and send it. So and uh, e-certificates will be issued to, uh, to your email address after a few days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, ma'am. Thank you again, sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. You too. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, sir. Bye. Leave. No, I, I think we can leave now. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Come on, leave. Bye.